Today, as a follow-up to the Zoom presentation we did last month, Tips for Effective Online Language Instruction. Our presenters, Damian Webster and Chris Harvey, are back for a question and answer session on this topic. Chris Harvey is the founder of Language Geek, a keyboard enablement app for languages, and teaches Mohican language online for the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians of Wisconsin. Damian Webster is Tanawana Seneca from New York and is a language instructor for schools and adult classes in his community. You will be muted. So please submit your questions in the chat box and we will answer as many as time permits. So let's get started. So. Our first question is from Sheila Nicholas uh, in Tucson. And this uh, question is for Chris. How is this conversation video used for instruction? Step-by-step -step on how you instruct this conversational approach and how is it created? All right, so um, the question's referring to a short video that I demonstrated uh, at the last symposium. Um, if you haven't seen it, check it out on, on uh, YouTube uh, afterwards. So the video is a conversation. Uh, this is a very introductory. We have somebody knocking on the door, another person saying, come in. And then we go through uh, a few opening phrases that we'd use when visiting someone's house, like, um, do you want coffee or tea, that kind of stuff. So the way we use this in instruction is that the video is um, made available to the learners long before the lesson actually takes place online. And the reason why we do this is to get the learners accustomed to the topic environment of the, um, of the, the dialogue that we're going to be using in that lesson. So if it's in a kitchen or if it's in a, um, you know, outside shoveling the driveway or whatever. So we're setting the scene, uh, which is important to do online because we can't go outside on the driveway and shovel it. And, and discuss the phrases there. And so they get the scene and then the learners are encouraged to uh, repeat the phrases they hear, not necessarily caring what they mean, just to get intonation, pronunciation and getting used to the flow of the, um, the, the target sentences in the dialogue. And the reason why we do this is the, the idea of learning one thing at a time. So we're learning context first, and then we're learning the sound, you know, sort of mimicking how somebody would learn naturally. You hear something first, even before you know what it means, and then make connections without translating from English. Okay, so the, the person held up a cup of coffee and said something, so that probably means they're asking them if they want coffee. So contrast that to being in a classroom where you write something on the board or on a screen, um, you practice saying it, you can see the spelling, you can see, hear the pronunciation, you get the meaning translated from English. Um, all these things are going on at the same time so that the learner is expected to absorb six, seven things at once, pronunciation, meaning, spelling, etc. So the point of using these videos is to gradually introduce new material in the oral environment first and then build meaning on top of that and then have everything in a context uh, that would be a real life situation. So that's how we use it. And the, the key thing is that I'm not making the videos, the learners do. Um, the, the intermediate learners make the beginners level um, uh, videos. That way they can practice the phrases over and over again um, and they can do the work for me because like I mentioned on the presentation before, that um, online takes a lot of prep work and the more that you can farm off to the learners, the better. Okay. Um, our next question is from Lorena Wabanos uh, from Ontario, Canada. And the question is in an emergency, in an immersion setting with children who are com competent in English, how do you get them to speak in the target language instead? Uh, 
I can start on that one since Chris answered the last one. Uh, just a little bit. When we were in class, um, we just modeled the speech for them. So we have our teachers, like they have to make breakfast and they can say something like, uh, the food's ready. Uh, like it's time to eat. So the other teachers that are sitting at the table with the pre-Ks can also say that, hey, hey, yo, and Dwadikoni, it's time to eat, you know, to kind of relay that to the kids. Um, whoever made the food can ask one of our teachers, you know, so do sweet, Donnie. Are you hungry? And the teacher can answer, eh, I got to sweet, Donnie. Uh, so they're modeling that speech. They can go around again, ask any one of the other three teachers in there. So the kids get to hear that interaction three times. Um, and then the teachers at the table with the kids, they can ask that too. So do sweet Donnie. And, you know, they can point, I got to sweet Donnie. So do sweet Donnie. And the little kids can kind of get up. Like Chris was doing with his, where you focus on the oral part and the listening first. So you're just modeling that. Um, TPR is good. Um, well, I don't know. That's more of the comprehension. But in regards to speaking, um, a lot of it has to do with the interactions between our teachers and the things that they say to each other, um, whether it's telling someone to hurry up or slow down or don't do that. Uh, the teachers this year or last year when we finally had students from our adult class, they used a lot more language with each other. And we started to hear a lot more um, unprompted speaking from our kids. Uh, that's about as much as I can speak to that as far as our little classroom. Okay. Sure, I'd like uh, to, Chris, um, to yeah, I'd like to add to that. So um, I, my, my first question sort of in response would be, do the instructors ever speak in English? Right, like um, not not just to the students, but to each other and the school staff and and out and about in town, um, is, is that the kids will will notice? Oh, teacher speaks English too, and then they're going to go right to English. So the teachers have to be really really diligent in never using English at all, so that the 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 relationship, the online relationship between the learners and the teacher is one that's done in the language because it's really hard to take English out once it's sort of um, become normalized in the classroom. So, you know, one strategy I would use with kids is just don't respond to English. You can give gentle, gentle reminders or little nudges or, or, or what have you, but um, just English isn't something that I'm going to respond to. And there'll be tantrums, there'll be uh, rebels, there'll be pushing back. But in my experience, those things don't last more than half an hour at most. And then they just sort of resign themselves to the fact that this is the way it's, uh, things are going to be. And if you can get the family following that same rules too, be it an older sibling or anybody else who speaks in the, in the house, um, that's how you get kids to speak your language because they're too little maybe to understand how important it is on a, a cultural or philosophical or personal identity level. Kids just want to talk to express ideas. And so they're going to have to have people who only accept um, sentences in the language. And specifically online, uh, we've come up with a bunch of survival navigation phrases like stangese pitamo, I can't hear, um, or akwanaka, um, the damn thing's not working, you know, those sorts of things. Because uh, th those are those key situations that aren't in the curriculum, that aren't in the lesson plan that people are going to break into English on. So all those real life interaction phrases have to be in the language as well. And I think just by creating a, a, an environment where the native language is used, the kids will just say, okay, well, this is, this is where I use this language, not English. They will fight back, but not for long. Okay. Um, <clears throat> our next question comes from Nora Greenway in British Columbia. What is the recommended maximum 
maximum hours and length of instruction for, per course. Chris? Me? Sure. Oh, um, so we've tried a bunch of different time lengths and uh, we've gone from 15 minutes with children up to four hours a day with adults. And the, the, the four hours a day we've just started doing um, and, you know, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how that works out. Um, one of the tricks we're doing is because it takes so many hours of practice in the language to become a speaker, um, with kids, you can't really sit them, in our experience anyway, you can't sit uh, most kids in front of a screen for a half an hour and expect them to pay attention. So our strategy has been to teach parents instead. So it's a kid's class, but parents have to come um, maybe a day before or a couple days before. And the same material that's being taught to the kids is taught to the parents. So that when it becomes time for the kids to log on, they're not just hearing the, the input from the instructor, they're hearing it from mom or dad, grandma, grandpa, cousins, whatever. And so we get the whole family learning at the same time, but the adults already know the information. And so that way the instruction is in so much coming from the screen. It's almost like I'm um, cueing the parents to say something. And then the parent says it to the kid, the kid responds to the parent, and then we go through that cycle again. So we're creating a interfamily dialogue, interfamily learning uh, by teaching the parents first. Of course, we tell the parents that it's a kid's class, right? But really it's a parent's class. It's a full family class because really what we're striving for are families that speak the language to each other. Damien, do you have anything to that question? How many, uh, the recommended maximum hours and length of instruction per course? Uh, it, it varies on whether it's kids or adults, but for us, because of our limitations with Wi-Fi on the res, uh, we're just kind of limiting our pre-recorded lessons to about five, maybe 10 minutes if I can't squeeze it all in in five minutes. But the same thing, it, it's got to be accessible to the parents so they can relay it. Uh, a lot of times it gets put on the teachers at the school that we have to do all the teaching and that's our job on our end, but we, we can't do it without the support. Uh, but in regards to the hours and instruction, I mean, when we were in class, we had six hour days, five days a week. Um, but right now with the online, uh, and the lack of having a solid Wi-Fi connection, we're limiting our short lessons to about five to 10 minutes. And then you just make a whole bunch of those so they can take a minute there, uh, leisure. Ah, good, okay. So the next question is, how crucial is it to consider the perspective of a language learner and how they will absorb content in an online language lesson? I think- This was from um, Linda Track in Alaska. No, no, that was from, I'm sorry, Cheryl and Anala in Arizona. I just really like to rely on second language learners. Um, and even for myself, uh, just remembering back when I didn't understand the language or when I didn't understand what I was learning and uh, the way that I had to make heads or tails of it. Um, so when the students are confused, uh, usually we just start over. Uh, if we're doing conjugations, if we're doing sentences, um, if I have a higher achieving student, I'll ask that student the exact same question so that the lower achieving student can kind of hear the feedback. And then I'll ask them the same question. Uh, if they still can't get it, I'll ask that high achieving student again, the same question. And then I'll ask them, I'll even have the higher student ask me the same question and I'll respond just so they kind of get an idea of like what we're talking about. But um, you just have to create that safe learning environment. And um, some of our teachers, learn the old school way, which was really tough, uh, sitting with speakers who were very strict, um, not as forgiving. And it worked for them, but it doesn't always necessarily 
mean that it's going to work for uh, people entering a program, learning a second language from another second language. Uh, I think, I think one of the best things a teacher can do of a language is go take an immersion course in another language. Because so many, so many people grew up bilingual or grew up, um, you know, speaking the native language themselves and um, haven't gone through the rigmarole of an immersion course, which is different from, from learning language and in, in either naturally or like you said being being forced um, in a, in a um, oppressive school system so what that lets the teacher do is it lets them feel um, the burnout the frustration the celebration um, all of the emotions that are associated with being a language student um, you know all, all those people who are second language learners out there have have gone on the roller coaster of, of um, emotions and wanting to give up and, and realizing that you just got something right. And I think teachers that have tried to learn another language will be able to spot that because they will have lived through the same thing. So, ah, th that guy, um, her, you know, her brain has just shut off. She's had enough. So I'm not going to give her new conjugation questions or something like that. Or this guy, he just figured out something that I know he never figured out before. And I want to point, point that out and congratulate that learner, um, you know, or, or she's, she's got it down. She's got it down. This, this guy doesn't. So let's get those two maybe in a side room talking to each other and I can give um, focus to the person who's struggling a bit. Because learners aren't necessarily going to be upfront and communicative about when they're struggling, you know, you, you, especially online, you just feel alone. And um, so I think that the learner's experience from a, a grammar perspective or, or vocab perspective is well, you know, well covered in, in books and, and teaching courses and pedagogy and all that. But I think we really have to address the emotional um, and psychological life of a, of a language learner. And as a teacher to be able to recognize that and get those nonverbal communication um, eyes peeled. And the best way to do that is learn, learn your neighbor's language. So look on a map, find the language that's <laughs> 20 miles from your house and go see if they have a program and go learn that. Great suggestions. Um, Scott Kendall from Pennsylvania. Do you have any suggestions about effective sharing online of common content inside of language families, such as templates? So I'd like to um, start because the, the, the person asking the question here is coming from a, a language that is currently sleeping, that's dormant, and that there aren't any active speakers. So we're in a similar situation with Mohican, is that the last speakers passed away in the 1930s. And so we're relying on written materials that exist, you know, that people wrote down in the past, but we're also relying on related languages, so other languages in the Algonquian family, to help us um, kind of, okay, well, how would a person who is a fluent speaker describe this? Maybe a, a telephone or a, um, a motorboat or whatever. And so by looking at, let's say, um, you know, related languages, how they describe these things, we can get into an Algonquian um, mental state and start saying, oh, okay, so if we want to recreate this word, this is how we would do it. And then we can use the building blocks that we know in Mohican to recreate these ideas. However, um, the danger of course is that each language, although they're in the same family, have different kind of idiomatic sayings, have different um, ways of describing situations and such. And you don't want to rely too heavily on, let's say, a curriculum from a rela related language and just translate it over directly because it'll be artificial 
And I think, Damien, you have um, experience in that. Uh oh. Yeah. Um, so we have a program from the Mohawk, Ongomanig, uh, and Jokwa in Six Nations, which was sent down to Allegheny the Senecas who translated it all over to Seneca. And as we brought it out to our territory and met with our speaker at the time, um, just some of the things didn't translate over directly from Mohawk. Um, it's just like Chris said, some of the expressions, they're just different. Uh, even some of the verbs that they use aren't the way we use them and vice versa. And then in working with people in Cayuga and Oneida, we also see verbs that, you know, we use them a certain way, but, you know, they'll ask me, well, how come you guys use that one? Uh, so it's not always transferable. I think if you are going to share templates across a language family, it's got to be like more of the basics where they're more likely to just be uh, similar across the board. But once you start getting into expressions and, and all things like that, uh, you got to, you got to double check them. Uh, they're not always going to work like Chris said. I, th I think what we can do is um, in the same language family, kind of look at, at conceptual similarities. So for instance, if um, because Mohican's a, an Algonquian language, it has um, certain features that it shares with other languages in the family. So for instance, um, uh, you know, the, the putting little um, prefixes at the beginning of verbs to say who's doing the action. Um, and so if I'm looking at uh, teaching those, how those work, obviously I'm doing that in a context of a real life situation. You know, we're not just sitting down learning, you know, niya, kia, nak, ma, nak, ma, wa, you know, going through the whole, the whole list. We're doing it in a, in a real life situation. But I can see, okay, Cree materials or Inu Aimun materials are going to need to teach the same kinds of things that we need to learn. So I can borrow it conceptually, um, but I wouldn't borrow it word for word because maybe, maybe you know, what's animate in one language is inanimate in, in another. And what was a simple lesson in one language is a really complicated lesson in the other because there's irregularities. So um, I, I think conceptually it's great, I think when you get down to the specifics, uh, that's where you don't want to be teaching an artificial language, right? Like you don't want to be teaching Mohawk with a Seneca accent. Or you don't want to be teaching Mohican with a uh, Passamaquoddy accent, right? We want it to want the, the language being taught to be as, as real and as natural as possible. Okay. Um, this is from Robert Cruz in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, how long can the lessons develop to reach fluency equivalent to instructor's speech? Uh, my answer to that, as far as our programming goes with online, we're still kind of in the uncharted waters on that as far as the how much they're leveling up. Uh, I can check when we have our weekly meetings uh, for about an hour. Um, but it's just this whole COVID thing has really kind of changed the dynamic of, of what we're doing. So, um, and I don't even consider myself uh, a fluent speaker. I'm just kind of further along than a lot of the other uh, learners right now. Um, but yeah, it's kind of hard to, to say uh, it, you can kind of guess that they're, if they're developing sentences and even asking you things on their own, uh, creating their own sentences and kind of asking you, you know, could I say this or, um, that's kind of an idea to kind of see, like, they're thinking outside the box instead of just waiting for you to kind of feed them sentences or feed them conjugations. Um, and you kind of got to, I give them a little bit of, of projects like that. To, okay, go in the dictionary and come up with a story and don't be afraid to pick maybe 
two verbs that we haven't covered, but see if you can use that in a sentence. And sometimes it works. And sometimes, sometimes the verb they pick, the English translation fits what they want to say in English, but it's not necessarily the same. Uh, that might be the first one they find and they run with it. And then you tell them later that, you know, contextually in the language, it, that's not the verb you want. You mean, maybe you want to use this one over here. Um, but we're still uh, in the trial and error uh, as far as our programming goes. Yeah, well, wouldn't you say that fluency really depends on uh, regular usage and uh, starting to think in the language? So it's kind of hard to say how long one would have to study, right? Yeah, yeah, you're just that constant exposure and even self-thinking. Yeah. We, have, we have our own thoughts as we're going through the day. Um, teaching people to do that, you know, you might be driving in your car and I'm hungry. Where do I want to eat? It's a simple thought. You can change into the language if you, you know, get going on it. Yeah, I'd, I'd say Does that, to yeah, to? I'd say that you can't get fluency from a class. Um, you can get conversational where you can spend, you know, your day-to-day -day life um, in the language. And I did some math and, and you know, came up with numbers and, and all that sort of stuff, um, which doesn't really matter. But the, so like if we were to say 300 hours of, of work gives you fluency, um, if you're meeting one hour a week, that's almost six years. Um, and that's without losing stuff, you know, from week to week to week, that would be new stuff all the time, um, if you could do 30 hours a week, then you could learn in three months, but 30 hours a week online is near impossible. So you kind of have to, the, the question is how much can everybody do online and then do the math from let's say 300 hours, but that gets you to fluency. No, it gets you to conversational fluency mm -hmm. for me means now you got to go out and talk to speakers about things that you're interested in. So if you're interested in learning political language, then you go, you know, listen to people who have great oratory and rhetoric or, um, you know, have have meetings that, that come to consensus and all that. If you're interested in um, in in sports, you got to, you know, you want to be a sports commentator on the radio in the language. Well, you got to go talk to people who play these sports and learn all the the um, kinds of things you talk about surrounding that. So fluency is, is a personal quest that you do after the course is done. But the course is what takes you to conversational. So then you can approach the, um, the fluent speakers to say, um, I, I want to know more about um, cooking. I, I, I want to be a chef. I need to know more about cooking. And we want to do our restaurant in the language. How do we do it? And that's, that to me is fluency. Um, okay. And, and like every good teacher will say, oh, I'm, I'm not fluent yet. <laughs> There's still so much more of the language for me to learn. And um, okay. so that's, that's my thought. That's excellent thoughts. Um, we have a question from Melanie Wabanasi from Meskwaki. Are there other ways to keep second graders interested besides Kahoot and Quizlet? Go ahead, Chris. So, what are uh, it's like eight year olds, nine year olds, second graders, yeah, uh, seven, okay, seven to eight, probably. I would say at that at that age, um, I think you can start getting them making content to some degree. You can they know how to use like an iPhone or something. They know how the video works. I think it would be cool to have um, people making their own videos with whatever little bits they know, and they can get help from the teacher um, and, and that sort of thing. But what, what, what I've learned about online teaching is that more, more than in a classroom, it really accentuates that everything has to be two directional, right? It's just not teacher feeding learners, the learners feed back into the class itself. So I would find computery projects 
um, which are going to invariably be, you know, videoing or, or that sort of stuff or, or drawing a picture and, and talking about it, but getting video projects that the, the kids can then share with each other. Um, that eats up a lot of time that, that they're learning the language, right? So you, you're, if you're looking at, I want them to spend so many hours a week on the language, doing these projects and doing them as best you can in the language is fantastic. And there's a zillion video social media places out there that you can use to put silly hats on people or give them funny sunglasses or, I don't know, make their faces all scary blue. You know, you can do that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, Chantel Standifer um, is interested in strategies encouraging and assessing speaking for an asynchronous online classroom, especially high school students who would want to engage without using TikTok or Snapchat. So asynchronous, I'm gonna pass that to you. <laughs> uh... I don't know. I, like I said, we're pretty limited out here. Um, the only thing, like we have the pre-recorded videos. Um, we do the, as I stated in the video uh, last time, was the use of uh, Facebook Messenger with the recording because you can do voice recordings and uh, you can pass messages back and forth that way. You can ask individual questions to each other. Um, it can be to the group. Um, I don't know. It's just. Uh, well, that's a I'm good just, suggestion. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Heather Blair wants to ask, do you always have two teachers per group? I would We're love to have to two. that. Yeah, I'd love to have two. Um, there just aren't the speakers. You know, we can't do that. Um, so that's why we're, that's why we're, we're faking it by making, making videos, um, where we can have like the same person put on a different hat and play the role of, of, of different people. But geez, if, if, if there could be a couple instructors, it's sort of like what I was talking about with the, the, the parents and the kids is that everybody is a new learner. So we can get, um, we can get the parent and the, and, the, and the instructor to sort of bounce language off each other that the kid then picks up on. So I am a huge fan of having multiple instructors if possible. And um, I'd love to hear, hear how people are using that because I, I, it'd be a learning thing for me. And there We're was a second part oh. of this question. Oh, well, you, go ahead, Damien. I'll just respond real quick. Uh, we're working up to having at least two teachers in. Uh, there's a Cayuga program that has four separate teachers and they all teach their own section. Um, we've had one teacher in and once I, I'm the director of our program as well, but I also co-teach. And even just the three days that I teach, um, it's pretty taxing. So uh, to have an extra teacher in there to bounce ideas off of or to dialogue with, uh, the Oneida program that I worked with, they had two teachers that they could do sample dialogue. Uh, the goal is to have hopefully two, three, or four teachers in the classroom um, that can all do different things um, to help out. Multiple teachers that will work way better, but we're still in the beginning process of developing our resources. So here's a question for both of you too that I think you can answer pretty succinctly. Um, do you insist uh, that teens have their camera on? No. During class? No, because not everybody has good enough internet to have their camera on. Mm. Um, that's, that's sort of the truth of the matter. Um, I think that where possible, everybody that in, in our group anyway, has chosen to have their camera on most of the time. And when it's not, we don't ask about it, right? Like obviously their camera's off for a reason. 
and we just sort of let it slide and pretend like like um, everything's fine because they, they have a reason and if they wanted to share it with us, they could. Uh, Marie Dutra asks, I've been considering Kotia, wait, oh, co-teaching, I'm sorry. I've been considering co-teaching to have more speaking interaction. Is this good for online instruction? Yeah, I, I mean, that speaks kind of to answered that though, right? Yeah, yeah, it definitely helps because that, that gives students examples to bounce off of. I mean, I said before, like, if you have a higher achieving student, they can kind of be your, your sample person to bounce ideas off of for the lower, you know, the students that are having trouble. Um, but having a co-teacher, yeah, that'd be even better to just dialogue and provide that comprehensible input to your students. I'd like to think about getting a way that, um, you know, if, if we were in-person teaching, one of the things I could do is let's say go over to somebody's house, um, maybe at planting time and they're a speaker and you have the instructor and you go through, um, you know, planting seeds and, and, and that whole process in the language, that would be a lesson. You know what I mean? Like to, it's not so much having a co-teacher, but having an expert in the topic of the lesson um, there to converse with the, the, the learners and the, the instructor as well. Online, it's trickier because there's only so many activities you can do sitting in your chair on, in front of a screen. So I think we'd really have to, I mean, again, it's not something that we've had the opportunity to do, but I'd really want to brainstorm um, what sort of things could we do online to have an expert come in um, without them having to make PowerPoint presentations and, you know, all that kind of stuff, just to have it natural. So that would involve, um, I think you'd get a phone, get somebody outside, let's say they're, they're, they're a mechanic and they're fixing a car engine, to actually have somebody holding the phone as they're leaning over the engine and have them talk about it. I think that's how I would do it. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, Julia Giffroy, or Geffroy, how do you get parents to engage with students if they, the parents, are limited in fluency themselves? I think the parents got to be willing to make the commitment. Um, when I visit with Ron Korn out in Menominee, he just said, he said, we don't chase parents to learn. You know, if, if they're going to learn, uh, that's going to have to be up to them to learn and bring that into their house. But, but he learned kind of it was a losing battle to just like chase parents. Uh, uh, learning language is tough anyways. I, I think because it's, a, it's out of everybody's comfort zone, especially when you're trying to learn it, um, they just shy away from it. So it's really on the parents. Uh, but once you can get, those parents in if you can get them to buy in that together we can all bring our languages back uh at least build them up or have more than we have now uh you get those ones that you can to buy in and uh i like what chris was doing where he's like it's a kid lesson but it's actually a parent lesson it's kind of like a trojan horse uh language lesson there uh you know but if you get them using a lot of the vocab and just kind of what are their common interactions, like going to the store, going to get food, um, whether they play games together, uh, whatever they do, uh, you can focus on a lot of the vocab, the common interactions they have. And go Because I have a lot of common interactions with my daughters in the language, and it's just stuff we do every day. Um, and they use, they use the language with what they know. So, But that's me making my investment in that too. So the parents got to jump in. Yeah, I think that you're, there are going to be a lot of situations where the parents aren't speakers either. And so the idea is to keep the parents one or two lessons ahead, right? So that you're not teaching the, the child and the parent at the same time. Give the parents um, kind of prep study time, get them to learn it first so that they're not under the pressure of um, performing you know what I mean? At the time when their kid's learning as well, that they've already integrated it and it makes it more comfortable. And it's also just part of the social contract that we make at the beginning. Like if you want to send your, um, if you want to join 
our group uh, for the children to learn, part of that is that the parents have to come as well and they have to have the time dedicated to learn it because there's no point really, unfortunately, there's no point teaching a four-year-old a language that they're not going to use at home. Forgotten to use it and know where to speak it. So even, you know, lesson one, all we know how to do is, is I'm thirsty, get me a glass of water or something. Well, two sentences you now know in the language and no longer will they be used in English in the house. Once you know them, you substitute the native language in. And um, that's, that's our focus because that's where the most success happens in the family. Okay, we have a question from Wanda Barker. How do you teach cultural values, stories, teachings, land-based learning through online learning? Hmm. I think you kind of addressed that, Chris, um, you know, before about having guest experts come in, right? Yeah, or get the, um, like, we're, one of the things we're doing is uh, making move like making short films um you know on people's phone or whatever but of stories right so we have a, a set of stories that were remembered um from you know back in the day and so we're taking those stories and having having the intermediate learners perform them and film them and so they got to memorize all their script no no holding up a piece of paper and reading off of it right that's not integrated language they got to memorize it and they got to get up and film it. And by the time that's done, um, they've learned every single phrase in those stories because they've had to memorize them. So they're memorized for good. And they've also, you know, worked on something that is, that is uh, culturally specific. So, you know, that's, that's where, what we've been doing because we don't have um, the ability to like, go oh actually that's not true hunting season came along and we did a unit on all the phrases needed for hunting and the families would go together in their own bubble right to go hunting and so they were using the phrases there so i think the answer is it relies on the family because those are the people who can actually get out there and do stuff together damien did you have something to add to this I think you can make lessons, uh, little skits or storybooks uh, around cultural events. You just have to kind of weigh which ones are more, um, which level of culture it is. So some of it might be more exclusive and it's not something you just share with everybody. Um, other stuff is more everybody gets to participate in it and you can share that. And even that, maybe it, it's shared, yeah, it's shared with the community, but not necessarily with everybody outside the community. Uh, there is a, we visited a school in Six Nations and they had videos. You had to log on to a particular program in order to access uh, videos on YouTube. Uh, and you can post, like I do this, I post videos on YouTube, but I, I only give a certain person though the web address. So it's just for them. It's just for my students. Um, so you can, you know, you can have those where it's an unlisted video, um, and you can do that for certain people, or you can have a program where they're in. And that's also, you can, people have to sign up. Like we were talking about getting parents invested. Well, sign up for this program and you can access this video, you know, and anybody else who wants to get it, they have to sign up too. Um, that kind of happens with Google, Google drive. I'll share stuff to somebody because they're going to use it in a speech, but then somebody else wants that speech, um, but they don't have access to it. You know, they got to come talk to me or talk to whoever, you know, uh, you can still do it. It's just uh, putting that content together and then how you want to share it. Okay. Uh, Linda Schrack of Ketchikan, Alaska asked if there would be a demonstration of using some of the technology apps mentioned uh, in the presentation for both uh, desktop and iPad. I put together a video. It's a 13 minute video on just how I use the notes feature on my iPad. But I don't know if we're gonna have time to watch that. So what I can do is just, 
I can post it on my YouTube page and uh, people can check it out at their own leisure. Um, I'll try to put that in the link or description so that people can check it out. I have to upload it still, but it's a, it's a quick little demo of things you can do with the notes feature. Great. Uh, and Chris, did you have anything to add to that? Or um, I mean, there's, there's demos and stuff on how, out there on how to use specific software. But what there isn't is, okay, how do I use this software in the environment of Indigenous language teaching? Um, so I would say, no, there are no, <laughs> I don't know of any good demonstrations out there. That's going to be something that we have to make. And I think that, you know, we've got a, a great, great set of minds, even just here, seven pages worth. Um, we can come up with some some of those things but this is this is still new and uh so i don't have anything really sorry ah okay so um but damien you will um make available the link to your youtube page um, yeah actually i did send it to piece, right? yeah even i like could post it if they want to post it okay well we'll get on that then Okay. Um, <laughs> Willem de Roos uh, just wanted a question, had a question. He said, it's an interesting distinction between conversational and fluent. So Chris, I thought they were the same. Can you give us a few more concrete examples of conversational talk that is not fluent? Sure, I would say that um, <laughs> If I'm fluent in a language, it means that I can talk about any subject that I have knowledge of. So like if I'm a, um, I don't know, I, I'm, a, I'm a geologist and I can, and I study volcanoes or something. And, and if in English I can talk about volcanoes, then I'm, you know, I'm fluent in that. If in, in Welsh I can't, then I'm not fluent. Um, because I can't talk about it in detail, but I know the word for, for volcano and I know the word for earthquake and I know the, the basics so that I can have a casual conversation about a topic, but I can't have a, um, an informed or an educated discussion of that topic. So um, not everybody's fluent in every aspect of their own language. Right, fluency, I, I would consider that to be topic-based. Whereas um, conversational means I can say enough to get me in trouble, if that, if that works. <laughs> um, so um, I think that, that you can't get fluent in, in, in a topic in a language unless you go out and live it. I don't think that's a classroom activity. Um, I think you have to go do it. And that's where you get fluency from because fluency is also, um, it's also thinking in a different way, right? So um, I, I consider that even a bit before fluency where your brain starts shifting and you start dreaming in the language and you start um, talking to yourself for a half an hour before you realize you've been doing it all in the language or talking to someone else and you didn't even notice what you're speaking. That to me is high conversational. When you can do that, when you're thinking a new way, to me, that's high conversational. Fluency is then becoming able to speak in depth about topics. Would you say that, uh, this is my question, but would you say that uh, uh, one of the differences too is that, um, you know, fluency comes when you, when you start to think in the language without any kind of translation in your brain at all, right? Or that's conversational. Yeah, I don't think you can get to conversational without thinking in the language. If you're translating in your mind, you're not a speaker. Um, you're, you're, you're encoding English into another language. You really have to, to be conversational, to keep up with the pace of personal interaction, you have to think in the language. I try and make fluency really kind of, distant because I think a lot of people say oh I want to become fluent in the language 
Um, it's like saying, oh, I want to be a, a gold medalist at the Olympics, but I've never, I've never run before. You know what I mean? Um, conversational, high level uh, conversational is where you want to go um, in, your, in your own education. Fluency comes by living it. And, you know, that could be another 20, 30, you spend your whole life becoming fluent. There's always something new to learn. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, I think we've come to the end of our questions. And so, um, Oh, well, here's a question from Julia uh, Gifroy. Do you use questions for uh, learning a classroom? Like, how do you say? Do you allow that? I would allow it if it were in the language. Right. right? Okay. So that I could, I could hold up um, a prop. Like, what do I got here? I got a crocodile. Right, I can hold up a prop and say, you know, bathe you anyway, that's fine. But if somebody says, you know, what's this? I would ignore it. Or I would, or I would say, you know, you know, I don't understand. Right, so that's part of staying in the language yeah. in an immersion. Yeah, and situation. I think that's natural, right? Like my kids do that all the time. They'll point to, to something out in the environment and say, what's that? You know, and I'll, and I'll tell them that's normal conversation. Okay. And some of those are just, uh, we give out classroom phrases to our students as well. Just so that's, that's some of the thing that, how do you ask, how do you say whatever? Um, how do you, you know, how do you ask the teacher to say it again? Or, you know, I couldn't hear you. Um, can you say it a little bit slower? Uh, anything like that, we kind of give it out to them if, if they're, uh, that way they can stay in the language, but still, um, address the, the issue that they have with, you know, whatever they're dealing with during class. Okay. Uh, how do you help adults and kids avoid language burnout? Mm. Just make it fun. <laughs> Keep it fun. I don't know if you can avoid it. Yeah, I think true. I think be aware that burnout is going to happen and then give people a rest. I don't know. Uh, it, it, it's happened to me. I'm sure it's happened to everybody here who's learned a language where you just freeze up. Nothing makes sense anymore. And and when <laughs> when that's happening, um, um, I just uh, uh, sometimes I'll just tell somebody to log out. You know, it's cool. You're done for the day. But we talk about it at the very beginning of every course. You're going to burn out, which means that your, your brain isn't just processing anything anymore. All the voices come out sounding like Charlie Brown teachers. Um, and nothing, nothing sinks in. And we've just made it really clear it's nothing to be ashamed of because we all do it. And if you need to take a break, we know the phrase, I need a rest. And then you just, you know, turn your camera off, mute, go get a cup of water, whatever you need to do, um, or just take the rest of the day off. It, it happens. Um, but we really try hard not to make people feel ashamed for struggling, be that with the language or be that with, you know, just, oh, I had a crappy day, nothing's going to work. So, yeah, we just try and be really, really understanding about that, that people are going to burn out. Okay. Uh, well, I think we're about ready to wrap up here. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions, but we're running out of time. And um, so I think, Ine, uh, we posted uh, in the chat our ILI's YouTube channel where you can go to uh, see what uh, Ine is going to post. And uh, we thank you all for joining us. And we hope you will uh, join us uh, again uh, when we start our online symposia.
and uh, there'll be a lot of information in there. Uh, Damien just posted his uh, email in case anybody wants to direct a, a direct question to him. I should do that too then. Yeah. Do that. And um, I, I would encourage, because um, we didn't get to all the questions, I've, I've sort of scrolling through and I've seen some, is that I would encourage someone at, at maybe ILI or just to take down those questions that we didn't get to. And then the next time we have, uh, hopefully we get to do this again, um, maybe with some other guests as well. And um, maybe we can answer those questions too. Great. <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, again, I want to thank everybody for coming and uh, keep uh, your eyes peeled for our next offering. And we look forward to seeing you again. Bye. Yeah.